Okay, so hi everybody, welcome back. In this video, I thought we could go through some of the practice problems from the chapter 33, 34, and 35 lectures. We've actually covered all of the material from those lectures, so to prepare for the test, it would be good to go through some of these problems at the end of each lecture. So we'll start with chapter 33. This is the uh, lecture on optical instruments. And so we have a number of problems here. I thought we'd try this one out. This involves a double lens system. So here we have two identical converging lenses, each with a focal length of 35.0 centimeters. They're placed 80 centimeters apart. So that's the distance between the two lenses here. A candle is placed 55.0 centimeters away from the first lens. So that's 55 centimeters here. So the question is, where is the final image formed? Is it going to be real or virtual? Is it going to be upright or inverted? And then finally, what is the total lateral magnification of that final image? So try this one out, pause the video, see if you can get it, and then come back to it when you think you have your answer. Okay, so we'll start by taking a look at the diagram here and labeling some of the distances. So first of all, we have the distance of 55 centimeters between the candle, which is our object, and the first lens. So that would be DO, but for lens number one. So let's call that DO1. That's 55 centimeters. The 35 centimeter distance between the focal point of lens one and lens one is what we call F1. And that focal length is positive because the convention is to have positive focal lengths for converging lenses, negative focal length indicates a diverging lens. And since the second lens is identical to the first one, F2 is also 35 centimeters. And then finally, let's call this distance um, of 80 centimeters between the two lenses, let's call that L. Okay, so what we'll do first is apply the thin lens equation to lens number one. So that would be one over F1 equals one over DO1 plus one over DI1. So what we wanna solve for here is DI1. We want to know where the image forms after the light goes through the first lens. So to solve for di1, we'll have 1 over f1 minus 1 over do1, but we'll have to invert that whole thing, take that to the minus 1 power to get di1. So di1 is equal to 1 divided by 35 centimeters uh, minus one divided by 55 centimeters to the minus one power. And if you crunch these numbers, you're gonna get 96.25 centimeters positive. Okay, we'll keep three sig figs on that uh, at the end. Okay, so right away, this is telling us something about the image, the fact that di1 came out positive means the first lens forms a real image. Okay. Now, we can say uh, something about the magnification of that image as well, because the formula for lateral magnification lowercase m is given by minus di1 over do1. So it's the ratio of di to do with a negative sign out front. So this would be, we have minus di, which is 96.25 centimeters as we just calculated, over do, which was 55, okay? Now that's going to be, if we touch the numbers, um, 
minus 1.75, which indicates that we're dealing with an inverted image. In other words, the magnification coming out negative uh, indicates that we have an inverted image. So let's go to the diagram for a second. We have a real inverted image formed by the first lens. And according to our calculation, it's forming 96.25 centimeters away from the first lens. So in other words, the distance between the first lens and where the image forms, which is DI1, is 96.25 centimeters. So we get a real inverted image over here. Okay, so the next thing to remember is that the image formed by lens number one is the object for lens number two. But there's something kind of strange about this situation here because what we're saying is that the image formed by lens number one is over here on the right side of the second lens. But the light is coming from over here. It's coming from the left side of the lens. So here, light comes from this side of lens number two on the left, but the object is here on the right side. So this is one of these rare situations where we have to consider our object distance for lens number two, DO2, the distance between our object and lens number two, we have to consider that to be negative. Okay, so DO2 is negative for the reason I just gave you above. And we can actually calculate it. Um, so if we go to our picture, DO2, is going to be di1 minus l. Okay, so if I take this distance right here, di1, and I subtract this distance right here, which is l, then I get this distance, do2. But again, the sign convention dictates that I need to consider this negative because our object is on the opposite side of the lens as where the light is coming from. So we have, uh, yes, yeah, so we have 96.25 centimeters for DI1 minus 80.0 centimeters for L. And then again, I'll just tack the negative sign on that because we know it needs to come out negative. So this comes out to minus 16.25 centimeters. That's our DO2. So again, we'll apply the thin lens equation to that second lens. And this will be 1 over F2 equals 1 over DO2 minus 1 over DI, or sorry, plus 1 over DI2. And so we want to find DI2. That would be the final image formed by the second lens. That's one over F2 minus one over DO2 to the minus one power, which in this case would give us one over 35 centimeters. It's positive 35 centimeters for the focal length of lens two, minus one over negative 16.25 centimeters. And we'll take that to the minus one power. Okay, so if you crunch these numbers, you will get 11.097 positive. We'll keep three sig figs on that. The units are centimeters. Okay, so we round that off to positive 11.1 centimeters. So what this is telling us 
is that the final image is real. The reason being that the image distance came out positive. Also, we can find the magnification of that, uh, the magnification from the second lens, M2. That's going to be minus di2 over do2. And so we'll have minus 11.097 centimeters divided by do2, which again has a negative sign attached to it minus 16.25 centimeters. Okay, so you crunch these numbers now and you get something positive, positive 0 0.6829. But we're not done yet. The total magnification is what we care about here. And that would be So the total lateral magnification is the product of M1 and M2. You just multiply the individual magnifications for each lens. So M1 was minus 1.75. M2, as we just said, is positive 0.6829. And when you multiply those together, you get minus 1.0. 195, or about minus 1.2. Now, the fact that M total came out negative is telling us that the final image is inverted. Okay? So we have a real image. It's inverted and it forms 11.1 centimeters away from the second lens. Okay, that's what we found by calculation. So let's try to make some sense of what we just calculated by drawing a ray diagram. So here's the optical axis. And then on the far uh, left side over here, we have the original object, which is the candle. I'm going to represent it with an arrow pointing straight up. We have the first lens over here to the right of that. So this will be lens number one. And let's draw the focal point on either side of that lens. The important thing to note here is that the candle is outside of the focal point of lens number one. So a couple of rays we can draw go like this. So we'll start from the top of that object and we'll show a ray going parallel to the axis like this and then out through the focal point. So after going through the lens, it goes out through the focal point like so. Another ray we can draw goes through the focal point on the left side of the lens. But then after that, it exits parallel to the optical axis, like this. And then a third ray that we can draw goes straight through the center of the lens, and it's not even bent. It goes straight through in the same direction. So those are the three principal rays. And so far, we're completely ignoring the fact that lens number two is even there. So let, let's now put lens number two in the picture. So lens number two is actually before this point of convergence. So if it's just lens number one, and that's it, then the rays of light will converge right here, and that's where the image will form, and you'll get this inverted real image uh, formed by lens number one. But before the rays of light actually can converge like this, they're going to go through lens number two. So lens number two is before that point of convergence like this. So actually what I have to do is erase those rays that I drew earlier. So the rays are accurate up until the point 
where they go through lens number two, but after that we have to modify the ray diagram because they don't just go in straight lines after that. So lens number two is a converging lens. So what does a converging lens do? It makes rays of light come together. But these rays of light right here, we're already coming together. So the fact that I have a converging lens means they'll come together even faster. So here's how I'll show that. This ray down here bends towards the optical axis. Uh, so does this one. And then so does this one. So in other words, the rays of light still converge at a point on uh, this side of the second lens, but the rays converge faster than they would with just lens number one. So you still get this real inverted image just as you would if it was only lens number one in the system, but you just get it closer uh, to the lens than you would otherwise, okay? Because the rays converge faster, they converge closer to the lens than they would otherwise. Okay, so let's take a look at another example. This one is from chapter 34, which covers interference of light. So suppose you set up a 10.0 centimeter wide viewing screen a distance of 1.35 meters from a double slit screen. The two slits are spaced 0.105 millimeters apart. A green laser beam that has a wavelength of 535 nanometers is sent through the slits. So a few questions on this scenario. What is the spacing in centimeters of the bright fringes on the screen? So in other words, how far apart are these bright spots that neighbor each other on the screen. And then what is the angle between those bright fringes on the screen? So rather giving this as a distance in centimeters, we'll give it as an angle in degrees. And then finally, calculate how many complete bright fringes will appear on the screen. So again, the screen itself is 10 centimeters wide. So we'll actually be able to count up how many bright spots we'll see on that screen. So pause the video, see if you can get these uh, questions, and then we'll go through it together. So let's start by drawing a picture of what's going on here. So we have a double slit screen where the spacing between the slits is given by D. And then over here, we have a viewing screen. And this is where we project the light onto to see the interference pattern. So what we typically do is draw the center line. So this is a line that goes from the slit screen to the viewing screen and passes right in the middle of those two slits. The distance between those two screens is L. And let's actually sketch out the interference pattern. So if we have green light, we're gonna have a bright green spot right at the center. And then secondary spots on either side of that and so on. So if we want to measure or locate one of those spots, we can do that um, by drawing a line from the center of the slits to the location of that spot. In that line, we'll make an angle theta with respect to our center line. But also we can measure the distance on the screen. Let's call that distance Y. Okay, so one thing that we derived in class is that the interference maxima, that is the bright spots, those are located at positions where d sine theta is equal to m times lambda, where m can take on values starting at zero 
and then one, two, three, and so on. So just integer values. But we also see that in the picture we just drew, we have constructed a right triangle where if we take tangent of the angle theta, that's the opposite side of that triangle over the adjacent side. Well, the opposite side is y and the adjacent side is l. So the next thing we'll do is bring in the small angle approximation. Okay, that says, as long as theta is much, much less than one radian, then tangent of theta and sine of theta are approximately the same thing. So we're gonna use that and we're gonna use that in the first equation I wrote down, d sine theta is equal to m lambda. Well, basically, we can say d times tangent theta is approximately equal to m times lambda because assuming small angles, again, sine and tangent are basically the same thing. But tangent, as we said earlier, is y over l. So d times y over l is approximately equal to m times lambda which means y, the distance between the very center and some particular bright spot, that's equal to m lambda l divided by d. So here, let's remember how this numbering system works. At the very center, we have m equals zero. Okay. And then on either side of that, Um, yeah, on either side of that, we have m equals 1, and then m equals 2, and so on. So this equation we just came up with says if you plug in a particular value of m, it will tell you the distance from the center that that bright spot is located. But the distance between adjacent spots. So for example, the distance between m equals two and uh, m equals three, or it could be the distance between m equals four and m equals five, it doesn't really matter as long as the spots are right next to each other. The way we can talk about this generally is by saying delta y, the distance between those two spots, is y m plus 1 minus y m. So this could be like y3 minus y2 or y4 minus y3, right? Anything that fits that pattern. So the distance delta y we're looking for is, okay, I have m plus 1 lambda L over D minus M lambda L over D. That's the distance between two neighboring spots. Lambda L over D is something we can pull out. And then I have M plus one minus M. M's cancel. So this is just lambda L over D. That's the distance between two neighboring spots. Now, Let's calculate a number. Delta Y is lambda, which is 535 nanometers. That's 535 times 10 to the minus 9 meters times L, which is 1.35 meters. Um, so that goes here. And then divide that by D, which is the spacing of the slits, which is 0 0.105 millimeters or 10 to the minus three meters. So if you calculate this, it comes out to 0 0.006878 with three sig figs and the units are meters because meters cancel here and here, but we'll still be left with meters here. And we could also write this as 6.88 millimeters. 
So that's how, that's how far apart these bright spots on the screen are, 6.88 millimeters between neighboring bright spots. But now let's give that as an angle. So here's the idea behind this. The angle we're talking about is really small because we have a really tiny distance between spots on the screen over here, that's our delta y. But the distance to the screen, L, is much bigger than that. So we want this angle alpha here as an approximation, which works for small angles. We can treat delta y as an arc length on a very large circle. So a small arc length, I should say, on a very large circle. That's basically what we have because L is so much bigger than delta y. So for that reason, um, we'll remember that if we can treat this as an arc length, then the angle alpha measured in radians is equal to that arc length over the radius, which means it's delta y over L. So if we calculate this, we get alpha in units of radians. Our delta y was 0 0.006878 meters from just a second ago. Our L is 1.35 meters. So this comes out in radians. We have 0 0.005177 radians with three sig figs. And, and notice how meters just canceled out on the top and bottom of this fraction. When that's the case, when you have the ratio of two lengths, implicitly the units are radians, okay? So what we'll do next is convert that to degrees. So we have uh, 0 0.005177 radians with three sig figs. If we convert that to degrees, uh, we have two pi radians and 360 degrees as equivalent uh, quantities. So we cancel out radians. And if you crunch these numbers, you'll get 0 0.2966 degrees or 0 0.297 degrees. So by the way, the assumption that the angles involved here are small is perfectly valid. You can see that uh, just in the quantities we worked out. Okay, lastly, we want to know how many bright spots in total are we going to see on the screen? So again, let's draw the picture. We have the slit screen, and then we have the viewing screen over here. And let's call the size of that viewing screen W. Let's draw the center line as we always do. And then the angle theta is measured off of that center line. But here's the thing, there's a maximum value for that angle theta, and if you go past it, you just go off the screen. So theta max to stay on the screen is what I'm showing you here. So we have a right triangle. I can take the tangent of theta max. That's again, opposite over adjacent, uh, just as we did up here. And so that would be, in this case, half of W would be this opposite side here, W over two, and then L would be the adjacent side. So theta max is tangent inverse of W over 2L, 
or tangent inverse of, okay, so W is 10 centimeters or 0 0.100 meters. Then we have two times L, which is 1.35 meters. If you crunch those numbers, you're gonna find that it works out to 2.121 degrees. So that's your maximum angle before you go off the screen. But remember, you have bright spots whenever d sine theta is equal to m lambda. So what I'm going to do here is actually solve for m. m is equal to d sine theta over lambda. And if we have m max, we'll have to plug in theta max over here. So M max represents the last spot on the screen that we see. So if we, if we find M max is equal to 10, then that means there are 10 spots from the center on that screen. But anyway, let's, ca let's uh, calculate this. We have D, which is 0 0.105, 10 to the minus three meters. And then we have sine theta max, which is 2.121, degrees. And then we divide out lambda, which is 535, 10 to the minus 9 meters. Now this will work out to 7.26. So how do we interpret this? There are seven complete bright spots. Okay, we don't get the M equals eight bright spot. That's gonna be off the screen, but we do get the M equals seven bright spot. So there are seven complete bright spots on either side of the center. Again, remember how this works. We have a screen, we have an interference pattern. At the very, very center, this is M equals zero. Okay, then we have m equals 1, m equals 2, m equals 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7. And then after that, we're just going off the screen. So that last one that is still on the screen is m equals 7. But it looks the same in the other direction. It's perfectly symmetric. So we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7 on this side as well. And that last one is m equals seven. So how many do we have in total? Well, we have seven here to the left of the center. We have seven over here to the right of the center, and then we have one right in the center. So what's the total number? Well, we have two times seven plus one, which is 15. We'll see 15 bright spots on the screen. So let's try another one from chapter 34. Here we have a thin film of oil, which has an index of refraction n equals 1.50, resting on top of water, where the index of refraction is n equals 1.33. And then on top of that, we just have air, where the index of refraction is equal to 1. The film is illuminated by white light. So we have white light coming in and hitting this thin film. When looking straight down at the film, the brightest reflected light is red with a wavelength of 636 nanometers. That's the wavelength in air. So the question is, what is the minimum possible thickness of the film? So what is the minimum thickness T uh, that this could have? And then what are the next three smallest thicknesses that the thin film can have? So pause the video for a second, try to work this out, and then we'll go through it together. Okay, so we'll start with a picture. We have a thin film of oil. So the thickness of this film is T. Uh, resting on top of water. So down here, we have water, where N is equal to 1.33. The thin film is oil, so N is equal to 1.50. Uh, 
And then above that, we have air, where n is equal to 1. So we have to keep track of those n values, so it's good to put it all in a diagram like this. So the incident light comes in like this. So this is the incident light wave. Now, some of that light is going to immediately reflect off the interface between the air and the oil. So let's call this outgoing wave number one. But some of that light will go into the thin film of oil, then reflect off the water, and then go back out into the air. So we'll call this wave number two. And the idea is there's going to be interference between those two waves. So in order to understand how the two waves interfere with each other, we're going to find the phase difference between those two waves. So we're going to find the phase shift between the incident wave and each reflected wave. Okay, so we're talking about numbers one and two on the diagram. Okay, so phi one, let's do that first. Now, for this wave, we don't have any phase shift due to distance traveled. So if we look at the wave just before it reflects off of the oil, and then just after over here, it hasn't traveled any distance. However, you can pick up a phase shift due to reflection, as long as you're going from low to high n. And that's what's going on here. We're going from low to high n. We're going from 1 to 1 1.50. So there is a phase shift upon reflection. So that phase shift is equal to 180 degrees or pi, okay? Now on the other hand, if we look at the second wave, there is no phase shift due to reflection. because we're going from, in this case, high to low n. So if we look at where that second wave is reflecting, it's moving through the oil, and then it's reflecting off the water. So we're going from 1.5 to 1.33. So in that case, there is no phase shift upon reflection. But we do have a phase shift due to the extra distance traveled. In the oil. And that phase shift is given by K times delta X. Okay? So the phase difference between those two waves It's going to be given by, let's call it delta phi. That's phi 2 minus phi 1. That's k times delta x minus pi. Okay, so a few things to note. If we assume normal incidence, in other words, the incident wave comes in going completely perpendicular to this surface, like so. Well, then delta x is just going to be 2 times t. It goes straight into the oil and then straight back. Okay? That's what we'll be assuming here. So delta x is equal to 2 times t, just double the thickness of the thin film. Now, the other thing we have to deal with is k. So k is what we call the wave number, and that's equal to 2 pi divided by lambda, but 
the wavelength changes when it enters a new material. So we have to be careful here. This is the wavelength specifically in the oil. Well, if we remember, the wavelength in a material is equal to the wavelength in air divided by the N value for that material. So this would be the wavelength in air, which is what we're given, um, divided by the index of refraction of the oil. So we have 2 pi index of refraction of oil divided by the wavelength of this light in air. And so to put it all together, we have delta phi, the phase difference between the two outgoing waves is K, which is 2 pi N oil divided by lambda air times delta X, which is 2T minus pi. So to consolidate things a little bit, we have 4 pi N oil times T over lambda air minus pi. Okay, so here's what we do next. We know that we're dealing with constructive interference. This would be the strongly reflected light. And when we have constructive interference, the condition is that the phase difference between the two waves is equal to 2m times pi, where m can be 0, 1, 2, or any integer. Remember, if m equals 0, then the phase difference is 0. They're perfectly in phase, and they constructively interfere. If m is equal to 1, then we get 2 pi. Again, they're still perfectly in phase. They constructively interfere. That's the idea. So we'll take our expression for delta phi and plug it in. So we have 4 pi n oil times t over lambda air minus pi is equal to 2m pi. So let's add a factor of pi to both sides. So we have 4 pi n oil times t divided by lambda air equals 2m plus 1 times pi. Just moving this over to the other side. Let's cancel out the pi factors. And then let's solve for t. We want to know what the thickness of that thin film of oil is. So t would be equal to, we have 2m plus 1 on top. And then lambda air goes to the top. And then we divide out 4 times n oil. Okay, so if we want the minimum thickness, the minimum thickness that's possible corresponds to plugging in the smallest possible value of m. So m will be equal to zero. And our minimum thickness then would be two times zero plus one times lambda air, that's 636 nanometers, that's the wavelength of the light, divided by four times the index of refraction of oil, which is 1.50. Now that works out to 106 nanometers. So that's the minimum thickness that the thin film could have. But there are other values that could possibly work. So if you plug in, m equals 1, m equals 2, m equals 3. And you can keep going, but let's just do these three. You'll get some other possible thicknesses, which, again, it's the same calculation we did here. Just instead of 0, you plug in 1, 2, and 3. The t values you get are going to be 318 nanometers, 530 nanometers, and 742 nanometers. So this is the minimum 
and these three are other possibilities. Okay, so those are the thicknesses that this thin film might have if it reflects this wavelength very strongly. And so here's the problem from the chapter 35 lecture. We're gonna construct a phasor diagram showing the addition of four different waves, each one with an amplitude A. The phase difference between the successive waves is 60 degrees. So the question uh, that we'll answer using the phasor diagram is what is the amplitude of the resultant wave and then what is the phase difference between the first wave in the phasor diagram and the resultant wave? So this is what we're imagining. We have four different waves. They all have the same amplitude and the same frequency for that matter, but they're all out of phase with one another by 60 degrees. So the phasor diagram is gonna tell us how these waves add together. So pause the video, see if you can work this out, and then we'll go through it together. Okay. So let's start by drawing the diagram. Remember in a phasor diagram, each wave is represented by an arrow. So we'll show the first wave as an arrow pointing to the right. That's totally arbitrary. It doesn't matter which way you show the first arrow pointing, but the next one we draw has to be at 60 degrees to that to indicate that we're 60 degrees out of phase. And by the way, each arrow has a length A, the length of the arrow represents the amplitude. So here's our 60 degree angle. All right, the next one, also at 60 degrees to this arrow. So this one is gonna be pointing kind of up and to the left like this. Here's our 60 degree angle. And then the next one is at 60 degrees to that, which actually brings it all the way back around pointing to the left. And again, each one of these has the same length, A. So those are the four different phasors representing these four different waves, which are each 60 degrees out of phase with the last one. So the total amplitude goes from the start of the first phasor, which is down here, to the end of the last phasor, which is up here. So this is our A total. And we can figure out the angle immediately just by noticing that this is an arrow pointing straight up. Okay, so there's a 90 degree angle. There's a 90 degree angle between the first phaser and the total phaser. We also want to know what the total amplitude is, so we can calculate that just using geometry. For A total, we're just going to add the vertical components of the phasers. So here's how that will work. For the first phaser we drew, the vertical component is just zero. It's pointing straight to the right. For the second one, this would be the vertical component. Let's say this is A vert. So that would be A times sine of 60 degrees because it's the opposite side in a right triangle. The next one is the exact same thing. It's just A times sine 60 degrees. But the fourth phaser is pointing straight to the left, so it has no vertical component, that's just zero. Now, to simplify, we have A times two, and then times uh, sine of 60 degrees. Sine of 60 degrees is the square root of three over two. So the factors of two cancel we just get the square root of three times A. The square root of three is about 1.73. So this is about 1.73 times the amplitude of one of these individual waves. So 
that's how this works out, but I just want to point one other thing out about the phasor diagram and how to relate it to the uh, actual picture of the waveforms. Phasor number one over here and phasor number four cancel each other out according to the phasor diagram. Well, if we look at the actual waveforms, we're seeing the exact same thing. This one shown in blue is the wave that we represented with phaser number one. And this one shown in orange is the wave we represented with phaser number four. So notice how if we look at those two together, they're destructively interfering. Because the peak of wave number four meets with the trough of wave number one. So one and four just cancel each other out. We only had to really consider two and three, which is what we did in our calculation. Okay, here's another one to take a look at. We have a laser beam with a wavelength of 535 nanometers directed towards a pair of narrow slits, which are separated by 0.725 millimeters, but each one of those slits has a width of 0.125 millimeters. The interference pattern is projected onto a screen which is 1.25 meters away from the slits. The intensity of the light at the very center of that interference pattern is 135 watts per square meter. What we want to calculate is what is the intensity of the light at a point on the screen that is 1.25 centimeters away from the center of the interference pattern. So again, this is the pattern we see projected onto the screen. This is the very center. We want to go 1.25 centimeters away from that and determine what the intensity of the light is at that point. So to do this, we're going to use a formula we derived for the intensity in a double slit interference pattern where we actually account for diffraction. So pause the video, look back to your notes to see what that formula is and see if you can use it to solve this problem. Okay, how about we start with the formula? We have a formula for the intensity in a double slit interference pattern. with diffraction. So we are accounting for diffraction. So that formula is I theta, that's the intensity at some angle theta, is equal to I zero, that's the intensity at the very center, times sine beta over two, divided by beta over two, all squared, times cosine delta over two squared, where we define beta to be two pi divided by lambda times a sine theta. And we define delta to be two pi divided by lambda times d sine theta. Okay, so there's a lot going on there. Let's draw a diagram so we can understand what all of these variables are. But first, I naught is the intensity at the very center of the screen, so we already have a value for that 135 watts per square meter. So again, that is the intensity at the center. Okay, so we have a double slit screen where the distance or the width of the slit is given by A, and the distance between the two slits is given by D. Okay, so that's what A and D represent in our equation. And then we have the viewing screen. Here's the center line. The distance between the screens is L. So we have the slit screen and the viewing screen, which is where the pattern is projected onto. And remember, we can measure positions on the viewing screen with an angle off that center line theta. So that's the angle theta that appears in the above equations.
But then we can also measure a position on the viewing screen using a distance y from the center as opposed to an angle theta. So we are given both L and Y. So what we'll do is we'll use that to calculate theta. So from the diagram, we can see that tangent theta is opposite over adjacent. The opposite side is Y, the adjacent side is L. So tangent theta is Y over L. Theta is the inverse tangent of Y over L. So we have the inverse tangent of y is equal to 0 0.0125 meters or 1.25 uh, 1 centimeters. L is 1.25 meters. So those units are the same, they cancel. Um, that's basically the inverse tangent of one over 100. But if you calculate that, you get 0 0.5729 degrees, keeping three sig figs. Okay, so beta, we can't actually calculate that now, is equal to two times pi times a, which is the width of the slits. So we were given 0 0.125 millimeters or 0 0.125 times 10 to the minus three meters. And then we multiply by sine of theta, sine of 0.5729 degrees. And then we divide by lambda, that's the wavelength of the light, which is 535 nanometers or 10 to the minus nine meters. Okay, so meters cancel, top and bottom. And we're left with beta, which is actually an angle measured in radians. That's implied by this two pi factor up here. We're measuring this in radians. So this comes out to 14.68 radians. Okay, delta, that's up here, two pi times d. So we have two pi, d is the distance between the slits, 0 0.750 millimeters or 10 to the minus three meters. Sine of theta, once again, is 0.5729 degrees. Divide that by lambda, 535, 10 to the minus nine meters. And that works out to 85.14 radians. And so now we can basically just plug and chug because if we go back to the formula for intensity, we worked out beta, we worked out delta, and we know I naught. So everything just plugs into this formula. The intensity at this position is I naught, 135 watts per square meter times, in brackets, I'll have sine of beta over two. So that's gonna be 14.68 radians divided by two. So in this calculation, switch your calculator to radians mode and then divide that by beta over two, which is 14.68 radians divided by two. And then we'll square that whole thing. And then I have cosine of delta over two. So that would be 85.14. Again, we're talking radians here divided by two, and then we're squaring that whole thing. So that's a lot to punch in your calculator, but once you do it, it's 0 0.04734 watts per square meter, which rounds to 0 0.0473 watts per square meter. So that's the intensity at that point on the screen. And let's do one more. Suppose that you want to study a binary star system, which is 925 light years away from Earth. The separation between the two stars is 2.75 billion kilometers. So let's suppose the wavelength of light we're observing 
is 635 nanometers. With that said, what is the minimum aperture size D in meters of a telescope which could resolve the stars as two distinct objects? We're gonna assume that the resolution of the telescope is only limited by diffraction. That means we're gonna use the Rayleigh criterion to solve this problem. Okay, a light year, just uh, so we have the conversion factor ready to go, is equivalent to 9.46 times 10 to the 15 meters. So again, what we're calculating is D, that's the uh, diameter of the telescope that we must have in order to actually be able to resolve these two stars as different objects. So pause the video, try to work this out, and then we'll go through it together. So here's what's going on. We have the telescope, the aperture, the opening that the uh, light goes through has a diameter capital D. And what we're observing are these two stars. So the angle between the two stars in our field of view is what we'll call theta. But the actual separation, we'll call this S. And then the distance to that star system, I'll call that lowercase d. Okay, so that's all the different variables. Now, in this case, lowercase d, the distance to that star system is much, much bigger than s. It's much bigger than the separation between the two stars. So we'll approximate s as an arc length, as I should say, let's approximate S as a small arc length on a large circle. Okay, so in other words, D is treated as the radius of the circle and S is a tiny little arc on that circle. Okay, so Theta measured in radians in that case would be approximately equal to the arc length divided by the radius. Okay, that's how this works, which is S divided by lowercase d. So that tells us S is approximately, uh, approximately equal to d times theta. So next, we're gonna bring in the Rayleigh criterion. Which says that the smallest angle between these stars that we can have to still resolve them, theta min, is equal to 1.22 times lambda over capital D, where this is the aperture of the telescope. That's what matters here. Um, and of course, Theta is measured in radians when we use this equation. So basically what I'm going to do is plug in this angle into our previous equation. So we have S is approximately equal to lowercase d times 1.22 lambda over uppercase d. And what we're going to do with this is solve for uppercase d which is the aperture size. So if we solve for uppercase D, we have 1.22 times lambda times lowercase d divided by S. Okay, so let's calculate that. We have 1.22, lambda is the wavelength, that's 635, 10 to the minus nine, meters. Lowercase d is 925 light years, but every light year is equivalent to 9.46, 10 to the 15 meters. So that's the distance to the star system in meters. So it's a huge distance. And then s is 2.75 billion kilometers. Okay, so let's take that one at a time. Billion 
is 10 to the 9. And a kilometer is 10 to the 3 meters. So that's how we get the separation S between the stars in meters. So one of the factors of meters on top and on the bottom will cancel, but you'll still be left with one factor on top. And if you calculate this, you will get 2.465 meters, but with three sig figs, that would be 2.47 meters. So in other words, in order to be able to use this telescope to see the two stars as two separate objects, you'll need an aperture that's at least 2.47 meters in diameter. You need a big telescope to be able to resolve these two objects. So that's gonna be it for this video. There are a lot of other practice problems at the end of the lectures, so I encourage you to take a look at those and try them out as you study for the test. But we'll end it here. So as always, take care, be safe out there, be healthy, see you later.